Καλησπέρα. Good afternoon. I am from National Technical University of Athens. We will discuss about olive oil and olive trees. The sustainability of these products. Everyone knows in Greece that uh, the olive oil and uh, olive trees are uh, a major agricultural product and very important for uh, Greek economy. Uh, you see that Europe and Mediterranean area is uh, the major uh, landscape that uh, the olive oil produced. Uh, in Europe, Greece is the third country of olive oil production after uh, Spain and Italy. Uh, it has a portion of 18% uh, of this production. The, you can see the Greek situation. Uh, in Greece, there are 100 50,000 olive trees, um, uh, one third of Greek farmers are working on cultivation of olives. Olive and olive oil production in Greece rise up 1 million uh, 750 tons and 400,000 tons respectively. It's very important product. Uh, the olive oil produced in uh, olive mills, there are 2,600 about uh, olive mills in Greece. There are the, ma the main uh, production is made in uh, three phases uh, olive mills. Also, there are uh, 20 about pomas processing plants uh, that following the byproduct of pumice from olive oil mills. <clears throat> uh, this product, of course, is very major for Greek economy, but there is a great problem. There is very hard environmental impact from the wastes that produced from this production of oil and olive, uh, olive oil and uh, olive pie products. You can see uh, that in uh, one olive mill of three phases, this is uh, the main uh, producing process in Greece. 100 tons of olives needs about 130 tons of water and produced 20, about 21 tons of olive oil, uh, 106, uh, 1,600 uh, tons of waste waters and uh, about 50 tons of pumice, that is the pulp that remain after the processing. Uh, you can see that uh, the wastewater is a very strong wastewater. It's the major problem in all area of Greece. Uh, someone says that uh, the pollution that produced from all, all olive mills in Greece it's a similar of 60 million people. It's very strong uh, pollutants and very and very toxic uh, wastewater. And this problem is the major problem for uh, the continue of uh, uh, olive oil cultivation, not only in Greece but also in Italy and. Uh, uh, maybe in Spain. You can see that uh, the major parameters, pollutant parameters, is 
total organic carbon is with red color words. Total organic carbon, uh, the oil that remain in uh, wastewater and also in pumice, and uh, the, the total phenolic compounds that's very uh, strong toxic inhibitors for any kind of uh, biological treatment. Uh, there is a press uh, from European uh, communities uh, to, to find solution for uh, the treatment of this kind of uh, uh, wastewaters. But uh, the technology that uh, must be fined for this kind of wastewater must be technical effective, must be integrated, that means is totalized, not remain a, a residual pollutant, and to be feasible and also to meet all environmental limits that there is in national region. In parallel, there are many uh, marketable and important uh, elements in the wastewaters that are waste olive oil. In the wastewater, there is 1.5% olive oil that remain after processing of extraction of olive oil. Of course, there is bioenergy that because there are much amount of carbon, biodegradable carbon. Uh, also, there are antioxidants. It's important uh, chemicals, very important for the uh, uh, recent period. Everybody try to find or to extract antioxidants from by products, agricultural by products. Also, <coughs> uh, maybe the residue of the solid waste uh, could be proceed for a soil conditioner. We will see later for this. The major problem for biological treatment of this kind of uh, waste, solid at the uh, wastewater, is the concentration, the high concentrations of uh, phenolic compounds that there are in this kind of waste. Uh, in our laboratory, we try to, to proceed this kind of waste, and uh, we try to apply advanced oxidation processes, especially the Fendon process, that is very accurate and very effective on this kind of uh, waste. You can see the laboratory scale pilot that we used for the oxidation of this kind of uh, phenolic compounds. Also, after uh, the extraction of or destruction of this kind of uh, toxic pollutants, it, it was very easy to continue with a biological treatment, such as anaerobic digestion or aerobic digestion uh, that we will see later. This is a pilot scale plant that we used for anaerobic digestion. Some results after oxidation, you can see that uh, the total phenolic compounds uh, reduced 90%. This is a laboratory scale that we used for anaerobic digestion. It's type USB upflow anaerobic sludge blanket reactor. Uh, we optimize this reaction of uh, oxidation reaction before we use the waste, this kind of waste into anaerobic digestion to retrieve biological energy, bioenergy. 
Finally, uh, <clears throat> step by step, with many innovations, we join all these and uh, we have an uh, integrated system that uh, we uh, use the concept of biorefinery and retrieve many products uh, at the final we have a zero discharge into the environment let's see uh, this flows it we have two kinds of wastes the wastewater is the upper and the other is the pumice in the wastewater we at first we extract the residual olive oil that there is in wastewater after this we have find a method to retrieve to extract the antioxidants that there is in this is some uh, ingredients very marketable in uh, in uh, no days and after this we uh, proceed the wastewater in an anaerobic digestion to produce biogas and uh, from biogas energy thermal and electric energy uh, the the solid waste that is the pumice one proceed with the rest of wastewater after anaerobic digestion and we have a cocoa boosting to produce soil a soil conditioner after all this technology uh, the discharge the effluent of from this is zero it's th the concept of uh, biorefinery Uh, we apply this technology in a pilot scale, uh, quite large scale. I will say that it is a full scale, about a full scale. You can see uh, the bioreactor behind the two uh, tubes in the front where we uh, extract the olive oil and uh, the antioxidants. Uh, behind this, you can see the anaerobic digester that is type of uh, USB. Here, you can see the olive oil that uh, extract from wastewater. A view of the pilot from some away. You can see the, the flare of biogas in the night. Also, the produce of soil conditioner after of mixing uh, liquid and uh, solid waste. The soil conditioner uh, <coughs> has this characteristics. It's a very good soil conditioner. We try, uh, we, we collaborate with uh, National Agricultural Foundation in Licovrisis and uh, we try many cultivations such as <coughs> grapes for wine making and you can see the difference. This, uh, these uh, plants are the, uh, have the same uh, age. On the right, you, we use this soil conditioner and we have a, a difference like you can see. Okay. Uh, the, the basic concept of all process is that uh, we can, after all this process, we can uh, return the soil conditioner in the tree so we have uh, the sustainability of uh, the cultivation of olive oil it's uh, a new idea also you can see a, a mass balance of all this technology uh, from 
the input is uh, as um, a normal uh, capacity of olive meal. Uh, after this, you have all the mass balance, the, produce, the production of all kinds of pie products and also the energy uh, from the, this technology. The conclusion uh, after this is that a new idea uh, for using and produce all kinds of pie products that we can retrieve from waste, from olive production. Thank you for your attention. Uh, we thank, uh, we have to thank Mr. Vicidis for uh, his presentation. Uh, I want to, to ask for Mr. Uh, Kokosis to move uh, faster in order to... I'll try my best. Okay. Um... In order to have uh, and some questions uh, and uh, discussion uh, at the end of the, uh, with the audience. So thank you for the patience. I'll try my best to be quick. Uh, I'm summarizing, I'm sharing with you some slides concerning uh, a tool, a European uh, toolbox that we have uh, used extensively to develop, support, and analyze uh, symbiosis networks also, networks that um, combine uh, private uh, public uh, partnerships, uh, which is the topic of, uh, of the presentation of the conference today. Uh, I will not go into the details of the technology. I'll try to be uh, as brief as I can. I will try also to share applications that, um, that come out of uh, using this technology. Now, the principles behind the development of this uh, toolbox is to promote and support industrial symbiosis. I will share a few slides. It's about assessing, uh, at the same time, economic, environmental, and social uh, uh, criteria. We have uh, technologies that are supporting our analysis. They are <laughs> consolidating best practices uh, to the extent that we have them tested. Uh, uh, we have engineering knowledge, optimization knowledge, all combined. Applications include cases where we have urban industrial flows somehow integrated uh, with each other, you know, and uh, again, I will share, uh, share results on this with you. Just uh, one slide about industrial symbiosis, which is uh, a, 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 our ambition to, to see industry in the future, uh, to be sustainable. It has to develop uh, links, uh, not only with other industries, but also develop uh, integration with urban flows. And this uh, industrial ecology model, actually, we don't have, but we aspire to uh, get things into uh, this uh, kind of idea. Uh, with uh, research and work like the one I'm presenting here. Uh, we had uh, a background, this beautiful experience of uh, Kalundborg, we all know. Uh, it started in 1995 and uh, actually, uh, I don't know what the pointers here, yeah. This is the picture of Kalundborg before the symbiosis um, initiatives took place and then with the hard work of people uh, and the synergies that they built together, they have now built a sustainable network that you see on the right. And this kind of example, they have uh, tried to open up, if you wish, with a national industrial symbiosis model in UK with uh, impressive uh, uh, and significant uh, gains that you can all read in terms of economic benefits, environmental benefits, social benefits. Uh, now, the functions that we have in the toolbox uh, are appropriate to analyze uh, large regions. Uh, and here we are um, explaining, you know, uh, the kind of uh, data streams that we have analyzed in the case of VOT through a live project that, um, uh, that Professor Makato was about to, to uh, also share. Uh, and uh, here is the large area that we have addressed in this uh, e-symbiosis and the streams that went through uh, our analysis. In the background, you know, the backbone of the technology includes a large number of um, options, you know, for enabling uh, technology that we kind of have available uh, in terms of their efficiencies, their cost, you know, their LCA performance. 
we are able to consolidate best practice uh, by uh, using um, uh, information systems uh, technology, you know, more or less a rule system that will suggest options and help us develop networks. And the network technology or the matching technology, if you wish, is uh, helping us to connect sources and things together, one thing, and develop networks, you know, as solutions and for us to propose. And this is the background, so let us get this uh, feeling of how this works with a number of examples. Uh, this first one uh, relates to industrial ports, you know, as uh, PPP initiatives. And um, the representation here is with respect to the sources, the sinks and the enabling technologies that are around the ports. Here is Malmö, one, uh, you know, port where we applied uh, these technologies. Uh, this is the city of Malmö, which has been uh, more or less the leading um, uh, partner in this initiative. Uh, this is the area where we have uh, addressed the development of uh, symbiosis uh, networks. Uh, these are forestry areas that are a little bit distant further from the port, but they would like to participate. And this bridge there is the possible connection with the port, which is across uh, Malmö, which is Copenhagen, because more or less this whole area should be uh, and has uh, to be seen as, as a single thing. So in terms of this functional uh, unit analysis that I uh, explained a while ago, these are the enabling technologies, the blue boxes, the green boxes, which are the opportunities, you know, to pass uh, biomass into users. And the, uh, um, the red part will be the, the products that are possible to uh, develop. And this is the network we have been able to produce. The, uh, solution in ways that we are able to uh, recommend to Malmo, and Malmo is actually implementing this idea. This is a little uh, legend about the uh, uh, bioenergy potential, which uh, amounts to about 150 megawatts for the city of Malmo. Yeah, and there is little legend about the opportunities overall in this port. This is Visma in Germany, a little bit south of uh, Malmo. Uh, similar stories. This is the port. Uh, this is the area where investment is about to take place. This is the representation of opportunities in the port. And this is what came out of the analysis as a symbiosis network, as PPP network that combines again industrial and urban flows opportunities for Vismar to um, exploit. Uh, a little bit less in terms of bioenergy, just uh, 16 megawatts of biogas and 69 megawatts of bioethanol are possible to get from there. Mandova, Italy, a little bit further south. Uh, Mandova is not a, a, a real port, actually. It is a port, but it's a river port, more or less has access to the sea through a river. But then it has connection uh, to uh, Venice over here. So this is Mandova, this is Venice. So this is a river that we cannot see, and this is connection with Venice. So it has, you know, indirect connection to a large port. On its own, it is a river port that has access to several industries, agricultural areas, farms, pigsties, um, uh, chemical plants, also the city of Mantua, which is uh, the active part in this case. And this is the domain, you know, uh, of application that you see over there. Uh, these are the chemical plants, and uh, again, this is the agricultural uh, and farm activity, and this is what came out of, um, of the analysis as, as a, a simple uh, little set of uh, boxes, you know, where you couldn't guess, you know, that this is a network, you know, that came out of the toolbox, and this is an impressive, really impressive opportunity to develop, uh, to produce bioenergy, 680 megawatts. Uh, Mandua is uh, uh, on its uh, way to develop a biorefinery, is attracting investment, you know, currently as we speak. And this is a place where uh, actually a biorefinery, proper biorefinery will soon uh, take place. This is a little, and this is Astakos, this is, uh, we all know where Astakos is. This is an Aviva plan, Astakos is hardly developed, yeah. But uh, people want to know what is the potential of, of Astakos. They want to wrap up this port and, and you know, present it to potential and future investors. This is the analysis in Astakos. Again, with respect to these functional units, I explained before, this is a network that we have identified and uh, a significant 60 megawatt kind of potential uh, for biogas, 137 megawatt 
uh, potential uh, for direct combustion in the area again of Astakos. So this is all about Astakos. This is what we expected to get from these ports, and this is how the analysis, you know, uh, almost uh, doubled, you know, uh, more than doubled the, the expectations. Um, we are uh, actually, it is an active project, a national project, uh, AI4B. These are the partners of the national project. And here you see uh, the analysis in Thessaly uh, to assess the bioenergy potential from agricultural residues. Uh, actually, it's not just uh, residues, we have wastewater and, um, um, and other kind of uh, things that you see here, pellets, branches, olive peats, manure, uh, pulp, and uh, these are the networks as they are growing, developing now. At the moment, this is, again, an active project. Um, okay? okay? Just, just summarizing with... Uh, this is... Uh, different examples, the seaside example is a bio, marine biorefinery, more or less. Uh, this is an installation very close to five, actually adjacent to five-star hotels uh, in Israel to exploit brackish water, water that comes from salt pans, and use this as a background to grow uh, and uh, produce chemicals. So these chemicals, uh, more or less, are in terms of biorefineries. The red color is uh, duna and yellow, and this is the actual installation and again, if you extend the picture here on the left and the right, you will see people swimming. So, so safe and so friendly, you know, to the people uh, surrounding these facilities, uh, this can be. And again, five-star hotels, you know, all around the place. This place is a lot, the southest tip in Israel. Uh, these are the different chemicals from the marine biorefinery, yeah, that can be produced. And um, I conclude with... Uh, a, with solutions for SMEs, which is an Asian BIOS platform that we had developed on, on, uh, for central Greece, so the region is there. And again, these are uh, options for people to trade, um, to trade uh, waste. Again, this is a message for what we believe will be future uh, opportunities in this area. Thank you very much for your patience. Again, we'd be happy to answer questions. Uh, we thank Mr. Kokosis and Mr. Vlicidis for their presentation. We have the first picture, the first element of uh, uh, our picture, which is the technological advancements. Uh, we are going to um, go ahead with the other with other speakers in order uh, to have the whole picture of our structure, which is, which is the technological, the economical, the, 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 the legal framework, and then the schemes that are going to implement uh, them. So uh, I want to ask for Mr. Questions and the answers are going to be at the end. So uh, I want to ask uh, to Mr. Kostadinos Balaras to come here in order to present. Uh, okay, then. Thank you. Uh, it's almost good evening. So hanging there, we, we're getting close to the end. But hopefully we're going to have some good, exciting things for you to uh, justify your patience for being with us. Now, uh, we said we're going to be looking at some parts of this big puzzle. And uh, I'm actually going to be addressing one really big, important piece of the pie when we're talking about energy and energy conservation and the impact that has on the environment and so forth, one of the major targets that we have if we want to really change the way things are progressing is the building sector. What do we have? Buildings, industry, transportation. So what we're focusing here, and the numbers are there for justifying what I'm saying, but we have all seen it more or less uh, it's this magic number that 40% of the final energy use is going down that big black hole uh, of uh, buildings. So we do have more than enough of this, what we call legislation, the law, what is necessary to be done. But more than that, 
what we're really looking down the road is that this is not some short-term objectives, but long-term to get us at the end of the decade, past that decade, and down to the roadmap for 2050, when we're ideally going to reach what we call the nearly zero energy buildings. But more than anything else, do we care? Yes, we do, because we spend most of the time in buildings, we work and live there, and we are paying the bills. That's when we come in and we say, ah, oh, hmm, interesting. Now let's start talking what and what we can do. And one of the first things we will realize is that, yes, we do have a problem because we are in this part of the world, throughout Europe. You see the numbers there uh, of the aging building stock. Uh, the same situation is uh, really, as you see, the breakdown doesn't change much around uh, Europe. And what we should really focus is if we draw a line of when we got really serious and start implementing energy efficiency codes and regulations and so forth, the majority of the building stock is before that, was constructed before that. So if we need and if we want to make a difference in the building sector, we have to look at the existing buildings where we live and work. The numbers there, when you get a chance to look at, is uh, just justifying that basic needs for our buildings here in Greece, which we're talking about thermal protection. Come on, it's winter time. Not today, really. It's a beautiful day out there. But in the morning when you left uh, from home, uh, you put on a coat to feel more comfortable, to reduce your heat losses. That's thermal insulation. That's what we're talking about. And unfortunately, maybe sexy that most of our buildings here in Greece and good part of the European building stock is nude, which means does not have the basic thermal protection. So that means a lot of heat losses. And I'm going to divide in this effort to, to look at this, how we can help in this decision making process, uh, just to look at the era and the ages back in the 90s, where we're really looking to help support the decision-making process by providing people with the tools, with the methodology, to be able, not so much for a single building, that can be handled by an engineer, you know, you, you work with your architect, you're still an engineer, you work with it, but if you have more uh, buildings, if you have a higher number, how do you handle, how do you prioritize the needs and you put a price tag? associated to that, so that you know how much it's going to cost you to refurbish, renovate your building. And that is most critical at the beginning. That's the key of success. When you're first making your really big plan of how you're going to and what you're going to be doing, uh, it's the basic decisions that are being formulated. You need something that it can be quick and still accurate in terms of going to your building, Go through it, collect the necessary information, and be able with then that information to analyze the needs and how much it's going to cost you. So it has a lot of dirty work be hidden behind it with uh, the cost of the works and the material and so forth. And back in those eight uh, times, we're back in the 90s when we're working on these things, uh, developing these tools and methodologies, the priority was to refurbish. Make it look good. Meet the expectations of the building in the modern areas as they get older to be continuously used and so forth. But imagine, that's where the opportunity comes in and becomes really cost effective to start talking about adding or doing what we call cost effect of cost efficiency, take cost efficiency measures. So if you were gonna put scaffolding uh, on the, your building because you want to bring down the plaster, refurbish the exterior, make it look good. What can you do there? Add insulation. What a great opportunity. And then the economics, the finances become more cost effective. So that's at that time where we're placing this energy efficiency conservation measures. So the idea back then started with residential buildings, was uh, continued with office buildings and then uh, hotels. And I give you a website there if you're interested to go in, look what is the philosophy, how it works, the, get the tools, so everything is there available online for you. And then, of course, 
We're doing a lot of calculations over the years. This is the big pictures that I'm showing you. Of all this big list of options, of things that we can do to really save energy, not waste energy, but still cover our needs for the indoor environment. Uh, on a national level, doing these calculations, we did an analysis and covering the different end use buildings and uh, prioritize in terms of uh, energy conservation, reduction of CO2 emissions, you know, the usual indicators uh, that we have to express uh, the effectiveness of the, this measures. More recently, more calculations on the big picture, on the big building stock in terms of, again, being able to identify, uh, and this uh, uh, study now was focusing on residential buildings because they constitute uh, about 70 plus, 75 percent, the biggest, the majority of our buildings are residential use buildings. So if, again, if we want to make an impact, that's where we can focus on. And uh, of course, energy conservation, the abutment of uh, emissions, environmental issues, but also money. Because despite of what we're talking about here, and we've said various interesting things, money talks. So if you want to make something appealing to an owner, to your house, to your building, to your office building or whatever, you want to see what we call basic economic indicators, payback period. So you have different approaches that you may have, and these indicators there and the results indicate which way should I go? Help me decide what steps should I make if my priority is payback period. I want to have the most cost-effective measures. Or, of course, other parameters and so forth. So these are the options where you can help. And then, of course, we turn the page. We turn the page because we got into the era where we're talking about energy performance, efficiency, uh, nearly zero energy buildings, uh, uh, the big directives, the, the flagships of uh, the efforts throughout the union and in every country to reduce energy consumption and so forth. And what we're facing there, of course, there are opportunities, there are challenges, and how can we really make easier and facilitate the decision-making process again in the big picture for the built building stock. What we have started learning a lot from are the energy performance certificates. Again, throughout Europe, including Greece, we're building hundreds and thousands of uh, energy performance certificates that come in and they bring a wealth of information. And what this confirms is what we knew about our own building stock. These are the big pictures for residential buildings on uh, the left side and the non-residential buildings in the different climatic zones in Greece. What we already knew that our buildings are hurting. You see a lot of red there. Red means lower energy performance uh, grading uh, on the scale of our EPC certificate, which means they're bleeding the energy you're paying for. And that's, of course, uh, bad. Uh, what we're also trying to do here to facilitate in the processing, because there are hundreds of thousands of pieces of information that are becoming available. And every day, every month, every year, this database is expanding and building because we need to cover the entire building stock eventually and start to know it better, is that we're trying to put this on a map where you can facilitate the processing, the analysis. Again, in order to be able to handle that vast amount of information, you need the tools uh, to be able to map, to see what regions are hurting, uh, what regions should be having priorities in order to meet national objectives and so forth. In that framework, and uh, this is now the concluding part of uh, my presentation, we're trying to help in this decision-making process from the point of view of trying to resolve how can we make better estimates for the building stock, the national building stock in different countries? This is a European project through 16 European countries, including Greece, that we're trying to really have more realistic estimates of the energy performance of our buildings and then of the energy conservation we expect in order to meet our targets. How do we approach this? We start with the idea, or I need to explain the idea that we're not talking about one building. 
I said, for an engineer, that's easy to handle. I'm talking about millions of buildings, billions of square feet, of square meters, that I need to be able to handle, manipulate, massage, process, in order to be able to really make my plans and my roadmaps and my long-term planning, financing schemes, uh, that how and where I would be allocating money. And to really grasp that concept, we work with the typical buildings, something that resembles the majority of the building stock, we cannot analyze a million or what is it, about 4.5 million buildings that we have in Greece? No, we need some representative buildings, and that's what we're working with. We have defined them in terms of construction, in terms of these typologies, in terms of their location, in terms of the building age. So that this constitutes the basis that we're going to be uh, manipulating and using. And in the meantime, while we're doing that, what is in it for you, for the people that want to use that knowledge that we are developing, is that uh, national brochures, meaning national typologies of these buildings, are available in national languages, where people can get an idea of uh, what can be done for this typical representative building in terms of energy conservation, in terms of how much money I can save if I do one, two, three, four, five things. So this is available already. And uh, what we're trying to build on our knowledge base, on our know-how out of all this, is that we're using, as I said, some of the information we have from the energy performance certificates. Some of them provide the calculated and some provide the actual. Guess what? They don't match. Guess what? It's not a single answer. Guess what? Actual energy uh, consumed in buildings, you see there's a cloud because we're in these buildings. We're driving these buildings. And of course, there are specific, unique characteristics. How can you put all this information together? Sometimes it's interesting to note you have an, what we call an rebound effect, which means the calculations are showing less consumption than the actual. Sometimes you have that the calculations are showing more energy consumption than the actual uh, building is consuming. Can we bring this together? Yes, we can bring this uh, concept together by this adaptation factors, calculated, excuse me, actual over calculated to correct our calculations. And another exercise that we tried to do is what affects your calculations. One of the key uh, uh, information parameters is, again, how much time do you use your heating system at home? That will determine the actual energy consumption. What we have found is the discrepancy among the calculations, because they work on predefined, according to the code, the standard conditions, continuous heating for the entire floor area. What we have found, that a very small percentage, less than 20%, is actually resembling the calculations. The majority are using them for five to six hours to use and heat their uh, the system and isolate floor areas in their building. Logical? You are doing it, I'm sure. That's our reaction to really battle with the increased energy cost. That's what actual people do in actual buildings. But the end result, unfortunately, is this, that the majority are not happy with their indoor conditions. But we have to settle. And that's really one of the main results that we're experiencing during the past few years in Greece that simply Frankly, my dear, I don't have the money to really hit and reach the optimum conditions that the calculations, of course, and zoom and have. These are the green pictures that uh, some may claim as a result of the energy efficiency measures and the codes and KENAC and everything that we've done in Greece. Look at the indicators. The indicators are prospering because energy consumption of these fossil fuels are dropping down like crazy. Bravo to us. Not really. We just stopped using energy. We are very uncomfortable in our buildings. The indicators are showing big savings, but that's not what we're talking about. Remember, every effort first starts with securing the proper indoor environment. Then we're talking about energy conservation and so forth. And I cannot go without 
emphasizing that the end result of all these nice indicators and dropping of use of fossil fuels is what we have experienced through major cities in Greece uh, with the air pollution because we're simply burning anything we can get our hands on in open fireplaces, just barely to feel a little bit more comfortable. And uh, trying to put all this information together, the big picture is we're trying to adapt our calculations. You see the analysis we're trying to make somewhere to fit in there so that we can make more realistic uh, uh, estimates and um, really provide better tools and advice. And the very last thing that I want to mention is that we actually went and looked at another part of the issue of the problem is, okay, calculations are fine, theory is fine, there's nothing wrong with heat transfer thermodynamics or whatsoever. But what is really happening in a building if I do one, two, three X, whatever different energy conservation measures? Real data, real things. And that's what we're also trying to approach this. We're just building our knowledge base. We're not really saying we know everything, but we're trying to see whether if we have this real good quality data, whether we can approach uh, the problem so that we can figure out all these famous indicators, targets, goals that we have as an EU member state and as EU in terms of reducing energy consumption, reducing uh, CO2 emissions and increasing the use of renewable energy sources in our energy balance. And uh, I'm done. Yes, <laughs> yes sir. So, this is uh, really one of uh, the, hopefully, the, um, uh, the, the, the initiatives uh, that we'll also introduce now. How can we do all these great things that we have quantified in terms of financing? Because at the end of the day, we have to figure out how to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ballaras, for your presentation. Uh, we thank uh, Mr. Bergaras for uh, his presentation. Uh, this is uh, very important to, to us to identify the needs of the buildings in order to uh, go to the, rather to the right decisions for the energy uh, efficiency. Uh, so, uh, we are going to proceed faster. I, I want to please you to do this in order to have a fruitful discussion at the end of the presentations. So, uh, I want to uh, please uh, uh, Mr. Borchius to call Mr. Stella Berzeriani uh, in order to present the biofuels technology. And I want to, uh, yes, the biofuels, uh, biofuels technology. And uh, I, I want to mention again uh, to proceed as fast as you want. I'll do the best that I can and I will, don't worry. Yes, again, yes. Uh, thank you for uh, this opportunity to present uh, this uh, uh, project uh, called Biofuels 2G. The site is uh, written there for more detailed information from what I can present today. The Biofuels 2G project uh, was actually a development and demonstration project that uh, enabled a PPP partnerships. Um, however, we didn't know at the time, we actually not only worked with PPP partnerships, but we worked with 4Ps partnerships, as I will show you in uh, uh, briefly what I'm talking about. Uh, the project was all about um, developing and demonstrating technologies of converting waste oils, uh, cooking oils that we use after uh, uh, the process of cooking, uh, to, pre to produce diesel that we can use in our uh, cars without any modification. Due to the lack of time, I'm not going I'll skip this general information. And I'm first of all going to give you the final outcome of the project, which was a technology that enabled the production, the conversion of waste cooking oil into a second generation biodiesel fuel uh, with the potential to meet 9.5% uh, of our uh, Greek diesel demands only from this uh, uh, available waste cooking oil quantity that we can collect in Greece. And actually, this estimation was based only on conservative estimates of the available waste cooking oil quantities that we have in our country, because uh, as uh, a Mediterranean country, we, we love cooking. 
This technology was rewarded with the Best Life Environmental Project, and we were also able to get an innovation award in 2011 from the Hellenic Enter uh, Federation of Enterprises and the Eurobank. It was consisting of three phases. The first was to develop a network. Uh, I have to tell you the project started in 2010. At the moment, uh, waste cooking oil collection was uh, really at its, at its infancy. Uh, there were not available networks, and we had to find the necessary quantities, not only to do our experiments, but also to be able to demonstrate a production of a, an amount that I will show you soon of uh, this diesel fuel that we would use in uh, a commercial vehicle. Then we had, of course, to develop uh, the technology and finally demonstrate the technology for a few months. In order to develop a network, we used uh, the private sector. And for us, the private sector was a set of restaurants that would provide us of uh, uh, waste cooking oil. As I told you in 2010, uh, nobody was informed that we should uh, keep our uh, waste cooking oils in bottles, not throw them away. The supermarket collection uh, options were not uh, available. So we could only find waste cooking oil from restaurants. Initially, there were 11 restaurants, but uh, after two, three months, 23 restaurants that they were spread all over the area of Thessaloniki that this pilot project took place uh, belonged, and they supplied us with the necessary quantity. However, these restaurants also acted as collection points for the oil that was provided by the people. Because one of the purpose of this project was also to raise the public awareness and enable pe people to collect their waste cooking oil, not to throw them away due to the ecological problems that this uh, causes. So it, they were also acting as collection points. Here you can see a semi-track of the municipality of Thessaloniki that participated in the project, how they were collecting waste cooking oil. They were bringing us into our research center. We were filtering it to use it for our uh, uh, development and demonstration uh, phases. But as I said, very important was the public awareness. And we did this with dedicated leaflets that we were spreading uh, to uh, uh, these collection points. We had special banners that we were putting in major places, in schools, in universities. And also we had flags. Every participated restaurant had a special flag nominating that it was a collection point that, some, uh, that everybody could come and bring their waste cooking oil in a bottle and uh, leave it there. We had a lot of presentations in schools, in environmental associations, and of course we had our common technical journals and uh, uh, publications and in media uh, and in conferences. There was a lot also of um, uh, publicity due to this uh, uh, award, the innovation award that we won, and this technology and also virtues of collecting waste cooking oil were promoted via the media. I'm not going to stay because of lack of time in the technology development uh, much. However, I want to mention that um, this technology was developed by CERT, uh, the Center for Research and Technology, Hellas, a Greek research center in Thessaloniki. For the first time worldwide, this technology uh, actually showed the results. The technology were further enhanced by integrated renewable energy uh, sources for the production of hydrogen, which was one of the necessary uh, reactants that we use for the conversion of waste cooking oil. We have a station in CERN, we developed a station that uses solar energy to produce hydrogen that we don't just simply use as an energy carrier, but we use it as part of our production process. We were, uh, after we collected and we did the, the waste cooking oil and we did our experiments, we developed the technology, we produced around uh, 2,000 liters, two tons approximately, if you want, of uh, this um, uh, uh, second generation uh, diesel that you can see maybe in, in the picture here. This was the first drops that we were actually able to collect from the pilot plant that we had. Um, two tons from a research center to be uh, produced is a very large quantity, but it enabled us to be able to test this uh, um, uh, fuel uh, not only in lab scale, measure its quality, um, okay, these properties that uh, fuel should have, but also measure its fuel emissions while using it in actual engines from a participating uh, laboratory from the Aristotle University of Thessaloniki. 
And once we were able to uh, prove that uh, the emissions are so much and uh, we have a very good fuel in our hands, we actually demonstrated it in a garbage truck of a common garbage truck without engine modifications of the municipality of Thessaloniki. Here you see the process of filling up uh, barrels of this new fuel, bringing them to the uh, uh, warehouse of the municipality of Thessaloni Thessaloniki that we were filling uh, this particular uh, uh, garbage truck that for a few months uh, was moving around the city of Thessaloniki, promoting the project, promoting the virtues of collecting waste cooking oil because it was as it was uh, designated, it was moving with fuel from waste cooking oil. The achievements of the project uh, was that uh, we were able to exploit the optimal method, uh, methodology of producing uh, a, a diesel from waste cooking oil, um, uh, utilizing only renewable energy sources and wastes, uh, we were able uh, to produce a technology that uh, will enable us to meet the uh, 9.5 of our diesel demand, transportation diesel, I'm talking about diesel, we put in vehicles, just from waste, okay, just from waste cooking oil. The CO2 emissions improvement based on detailed calculations on, of our uh, actual production and the emission test data that we had was 14.5 to 15%. This is a huge improvement on emission uh, reduction. Uh, and um, I have to mention that uh, this technology did not stay only in reports and technical documents, but was able to also extend its PPP partnership into the form of being um, uh, exploited via the Hellenic Petroleum. Uh, how? Uh, we collaborated with them based on the findings that we had from this project in order to integrate waste cooking oil in the existing refineries. So actually, because we live in times that uh, investments of new technologies, especially in our country, are not easy uh, to, to come, uh, we wanted to utilize existing infrastructure, and actually refining infrastructure in Europe is actually being reduced the last uh, four or five years by 30%. So the declining use of this existing infrastructure can be utilized for actually co-processing biomass in refineries and producing hybrid fuels. Currently, we are running a, um, a, a, demo, um, a demo project for the Hellenic Petroleum, and we are hoping that by 2016 towards 17, we will be having hybrid diesel in oral passenger cars via Hellenic Petroleum. Now, ending my presentation, what is the relationship that we found and the potential of uh, such efforts with this PPP and maybe a fourth P, partnerships? Uh, waste, oh, it's, it's a possibility. It's a possibility indeed. Waste oils recycling, uh, indeed, is something that requires not only the private sector, but the public sector and definitely the people. Uh, Public awareness can come only uh, normally, I believe at least, normally via the public uh, sector. Municipalities, local authorities, um, normally these are the people that uh, are enforcing uh, uh, the public awareness, NGOs, uh, information in schools, etc. The collection and transportation of waste cooking oil can also happen with the collaboration of local authorities but also with some SMEs, and earlier we saw that SMEs development was a target for uh, the Horizon program, so new SMEs can be developed even via Horizon programs, and of course uh, with the collaboration of large enterprises. Now, when I made my presentation yesterday, I did not see the presentations and the good example of Sifnes and of Creta that I saw that people here, uh, people actually invest uh, in uh, energy, uh, uh, efficiency. So, uh, what I put down in the next bullet, waste oil conversion to fuel, I only consider the private sector as uh, the facilitators of uh, moving this forward. However, here we should also put the public, because indeed the public can really, as I've seen and I learned today uh, due to you, can be really uh, the most catalytic factor of uh, having these technologies uh, in practice. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention. And if I may ask, because I have to catch my flight, if there are any questions, one or, or two questions that, uh, because I, won't, I don't think I'll be able to stay until the end of the session. Okay. If I can ask that. Uh, 
if there is any question. Uh, um, okay. Uh, so. Maybe it's interesting also for the other hybrids and the other people that are here. Uh, we just received from the streaming uh, a proposition for cooperation uh, with, uh, with the Bulgarian uh, with the Bulgarian interests. Uh, they are coming from Sofia, but also from the cross-border area. And so uh, the know-how, what you put on the table, it is very interesting uh, for us people, especially because we have the, the oil at our home and our taverna and uh, everywhere. And so the same is happening on the Bulgarian side. Uh, you should know that also Patras uh, city has already uh, achieved in practice what you are proposing here. And so uh, they were just apologizing that they could not be here today to be promoted as uh, one of the hybrids or embryonic embryos uh, in, this, uh, in this respect. So thank you very, very much. Uh, we thank you, Stella. Uh, this is... Uh... I'm going to call uh, Mr. Bogius to focus in the main el elements of it, uh, his presentation in order to conclude. Good evening and thank you for your patience. Okay. So just, uh, it started uh, just a month ago and uh, is expected to end in roughly, no, in exactly uh, three years, so in 2018. So the Center for Renewable Energy Sources is the coordinator of this project. Uh, the total project budget is 1.5 million euro. And we have 13 partners in this project, four from Southeast Europe. So we have Greece, Italy, Portugal, and Spain. We have one Western European country, we have Ireland. Three from Central Europe, Belgium, Austria, and Germany and three from Eastern Europe, Slovenia, the Czech Republic, and Bulgaria. The main aim of this project is to promote and stimulate SME networking for the provision of energy services with EPC, so energy performance contracting. Uh, just to remind you, energy performance contracting is basically a contract whereby an energy, energy efficiency investment or service uh, is paid back by the energy savings. And please don't confuse this with energy supply contracting, which is uh, an energy supply investment or service paid back by the supply of energy, not the energy savings. So uh, in this project, our target group on the supply side are those companies, SMEs mainly, that are energy service providers. And likewise, our target group on the demand side, again, we're aiming at the private sector and mainly at the industrial and tertiary building sector, so hospitals, schools. Uh, if we really want to be ambitious, uh, we, the residential sector, of course, would be great, but uh, I think it would be very difficult. So let's, let's have a look at some um, information regarding energy performance contracting in the public sector. This is information given to us by our, our uh, partners in the project. And we have energy performance contracting and energy supply contracting. And we see that in the public sector, we do have projects. Uh, there is not a, a significant lack of projects. It has been working. Not so great scale, but it has been working. If we look at the private sector, it's a completely different picture. We have quite a few energy supply contracts, but really very, very few energy performance contracts. And if we go to the residential, we have barely no projects, very, very few. Why is this? If we look at the public sector, the main difficulties in energy perf performance contracting is that the implication can be complicated and lengthy. 
We have procurement law provisions, we have, um, provisions. We have difficult tendering processes. And we have very long-term and complex contracts, which really impede a breakthrough in the spread of EPC methodology. And this applies both to public buildings, but also to large private buildings. Now, if we look at EPC in SMEs, so if we're looking at, at smaller buildings, basically the tertiary sector, the main barriers are that we have um, high transaction costs for the energy services. So we need a, a large range of technical expertise. We have a large cost of energy auditing. And we have very case-specific contracting issues that need to be uh, accounted for. We also have very high costs for guarantees and also for measurement and verification processes. And when we say high costs, I mean costs as a proportion of the total budget of the project. And we also have investment and project sizes which are too small. So we have banks really are financial institutions. I, I don't want to only limit myself to banks. We also have venture capitals. But they, they are very unwilling to finance such, proje such projects. Um, either because of their unwillingness in general towards this concept, or because there's a lack of knowledge of the employees. How, how, do, they, how do they appraise this, this investment? And funnily enough, I think I left the, the competition from energy supply contracting is also a barrier. Companies which um, sell energy supply contract want to sell energy. They don't want you to save. They don't want you to put, do energy efficiency measures because the more you sell, the more you consume, the more they sell and the more money they make. So here we have a competition between energy performance contracting and energy supply contracting. So, what will our project do? In the first phase, which will be in the first um, 10 months, we want to establish spins in each country. What are spins? Spins are SME partnerships for innovative energy services. Basically, they are an organized cluster of SMEs of differing areas of expertise that jointly supply energy efficiency services and they have a, a structured and long-term collaboration with a commonly agreed objectives. So here we have, for example, we might have a small law firm, which would deal with the contracting issues. Yeah, yeah. I'm almost, I'm not much left. Um, we, have, we might have a small law firm. We might have, um, we might have a, a small consulting firm, engineering consulting firm, and we might have uh, various suppliers of energy efficiency equipment. They, this could be uh, a network of SMEs. So what will the project develop? It will de de develop uh, procedures and legalities on how to share the risks between the partners and organizational tools. So basically, we will be developing tools to help them collaborate together. And um, the SPIN should have at least three members, and each participant country should develop at least one SPIN. Um, each country actually already has one SPIN developed at this stage, but we are certainly open to develop more. In the second phase, we will be training these newly established SPINs on how to work as a consortium, so we won't be, we won't be going into details into energy performance contracting, but more the, the emphasis will be more on how to work together. The third phase will be the elaboration of uh, energy performance contracting packages. So these will be standardized, very simple, service-oriented energy performance contracting for specific energy efficiency uh, technical solutions. So what, what this will achieve is, this will achieve a high standardization. So we, we will basically be multiplying standardized EPC plus solutions in specific market sectors instead of having 
very few and big EPC projects. And the EPC packages will be developed in, in each participant country language. We want to have pilots. We, we are aiming to have 33 projects in all the, the 10 countries that we have. Because what do we want to do? We want to show the financial, financial institutions that these performance contracts work. They have, the, these financial institutions still are very, very reluctant to invest. I mean, a typical example, we have banks which are very willing to finance PV plants, which have payback periods of more than six, seven years, for newly developed companies. But they're not willing to finance small energy efficiency projects, which have payback periods of even less than four years. And this is why we want to, train, to show them that it, it works, it can work. And finally, and on this the last slide, um, we want to develop a transnational exchange platform. What we have noticed is that um, companies within the country are very reluctant to share their knowledge, either on payment or in any other way, because, of course, they're competitors. But this is not the case transnationally. So a Greek company, a Greek spin, might have some energy performance contracting issues and might want to ask another ESCO or another spin on how to uh, overcome some problem, and they cannot do this. But if they approach their Austrian partner or their Belgian partner, who might give his opinion, his, give his knowledge on payment or, or on expert hours sharing, this solves the problem. The Greek company gets the information it wants, and the Belgian company or the German company gets payment for this service. And that's all. Thank you for your attention. Half an hour ago, maybe I would uh, have cancelled this presentation because I'm not feeling very well for the benefit of this session. But uh, it's very brief, so I'm going to go through. Uh, so, uh, Mr. President of the ERFC, uh, ladies and gentlemen, before going to my brief presentation regarding CHP engines, which stands for Combined Heat and Power Engines, I would like to say a few words about the non-governmental organization of which I have the honor to be the Vice President. The Panhellenic Association of Environmental Protection Companies is the Greek association of all environmental protection companies with more than 70 members, active in one of the most dynamic and fastest growing sectors of the European economy, the protection of the environment as management, construction, technology, and consulting firms. As most of you know, the reduction of the energy cost is considered a renewable energy resource, and renewable resources have a considerable share in the protection of the environment. Beyond the series of objectives and projects of our association, PASEPE plays a key role in shaping the Greek and European environmental policy and legislation in a number of strategic issues of our industry. Our association, under the assignment of the European Commission, organizes in national level every two years the European Business Awards for the Environment. This is a very important European institution and aims to reward businesses which successfully combine innovation and economic viability with the protection of the environment. A growing number of businesses realize that protecting the environment and making the transition to a circular economy will provide a significant contribution to maintaining Europe's competitiveness. This, they understand that our competitive edge will be improved by facing challenges such as resource scarcity and energy is one of them. 
Greek companies, winners of these awards, compete among other 150 European companies at a European level, and the best of the best are awarded every two years. So next month, we will announce the new competition and the ceremony awards, first in national level and then in European, will be held in the beginning of 2016. The last ceremony at the national level took place in September 2014, and the following companies were awarded, as you can see on the, on the screen. So at a European level, unfortunately, no Greek company received an award in this round, while the most important award was given to a very large Turkish company producing bathroom and tile products. The awarded company project was entitled Blue Life Integrated Sustainability Management System. Concluding this presentation of PASEPE and the European Business Awards for the Environment, here are the top three benefits of these awards for your company. Being recognized at a European level for your achievements and raising the moral of your staff. Your company will benefit from widespread media and industry coverage, gaining credibility with policymakers who have environmental concerns. Now back to our main subject. I would like to say that I'm also administrator of Arvisola Limited, a member of Arvis Environmental Group. The mother company, Arvis SA, operates in the environmental management field with emphasis in waste man management at the national level. Arvis Timmerman Limited is active in special toxic waste treatment, while the fourth company in our group, European Recycling Center Limited, deals with material recycling. Arvis Solar, the newest company of the group, has been in the renewable energy business since 2007. I would like also to underline that this program, which I'm about to describe, is it in its very preliminary stage and its future will depend on the country's future economic position in the European Union and the rest of the economic world. Arvis Solar closely cooperates and is the exclusive product distributor in Greece and Cyprus for the Italian company EN Plus Italia. EN Plus is a main cogeneration engine manufacturer for the well-known Italian energy service company, Edison. EN Plus's engines are well known for their excellent quality and durability, high efficiency, and their smooth operation thanks to the long-term maintenance program and failure prevention. Our company jointly with the two companies, Edison and EN Plus, developed financing and installation programs of cogeneration co engines that run on natural gas. The installation of such an engine for producing electricity and heat and cooling, if necessary, is based on the current favorable Greek legislation on renewable energy resources and especially on CHP and has direct economic, economic benefits for the industrial consumer. This model is an ESCO model and the benefits will be split between the consumer and the financier of the installation. The consumer the customer, the consumer, will sign a contract with us for the provision of energy savings for the next 12 to 15 years with an option of a shorter payoff period of the equipment. Potential customers are industries that consume a large amount of electricity, heat and or cooling, like paper mills, pharmaceutical industries, pasta factories, breweries, dairies, food, plastics and chemical companies. The companies should preferably operate continuously so that the repayment of the credit can be made within a reasonable period of time. For the approval of the funding, energy consumption on an hourly basis is required for at least one year. Energy should be combined and could be electricity, heat and cooling energy. 
Using this data, necessary simulations will be held and our initial proposals will be given to the consumer. I will give you some figures of a big Greek paper mill. This could be the first application of the ESCO model in Greece offered by Edison. The data that you're about to see is under confirmation by both the customer and Edison, so I cannot give you the name of the company. As you can see, uh, the, the actual situation, the, uh, the total annual cost of uh, the current situation is about 2,700,000 euros. This includes uh, uh, natural gas and uh, oil, uh, sorry, and electricity. So if we install uh, a CHP unit with uh, the financing of Edison, uh, these are the figures of the cost, the maintaining cost and the operational cost. And the result would be 2,300,000 euros. So we have a reduction of energy cost of about 400,000 euros per year. Thus, the payment period is approximately four and a half years. And this is the end of my short presentation. Thank you very much. Mr. Donis Fopalakis for his presentation. And I'm going to call uh, at the step Ms. Stella Kivello from Padio in order to continue with the overall discussion.